Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this Monday morning session on this current series of articles. As we look at these articles, as we go forward, and as we open the Word of God, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for His guidance and His direction, so that we may more con properly consider that which we need to know at this time. Shall we now ask for guidance in prayer? Loving Father in Heaven, we have great need of you. Help us now to consider the words of your prophet, to consider words that are being presented so that we may be more edified and prepared for things that we need to understand at this time. I thank you, Father, for those that are joining with us today. I pray for those that have joined in the past but have not been able to join right now. Direct us and guide us so that your will may be done. We pray that the Holy Spirit may be sent to open our minds and that your angels may surround us so that we may remember that we are looking to draw closer to you in all things. Help us to this end. Direct us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. In this article, as the title implies, we are going to come to a proposal in regard to the study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45. In the several preceding articles, we've set in place a framework that will allow for this proposal. The proposition is simple, really, and is not of my devising, but only a return to the old paths as expressed in Jeremiah 6.16. The promise is, if we return to the old paths, that we shall find rest for our souls. I would think that this certainly applies in the case of our prophecy in Daniel 11. Regarding the use of each point is set forth in this proposal. It can be shown that each one has had, had, had its distinct place in their original setting and did not fail when put to the test. In other words, they are tried and true and are built, are what built the prophetic foundation that Adventism stands upon. The principle that Christ demonstrates the end from the beginning applies to these key points contained in this proposal. The principles were able to defeat every opponent and were what produced the movement of all the great religious movements since the day of the apostles. None have been more free from human imperfection and the wiles of Satan than was that of the autumn of 1844. Great Controversy 401. Point three. Mrs. White goes on to say, they, Millerites, dared not deny that the power of the Holy Spirit had witnessed to the preaching of the Second Advent, and they could detect no error in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. The ablest of their opponents had not succeeded in overthrowing their system of prophetic interpretation. <clears throat> they could not consent without Bible evidence to renounce positions which had been reached through earnest prayerful study of the scriptures by minds enlightened by the spirit of god and hearts burning with its living power positions which had withstood the most searching criticisms and the most bitter oppositions of popular religious teachers and worldly wise men and which had stood firm against the combined forces of learning and eloquence and the taunts and revilings alike of the honorable and the base, Great Controversy 405.3. So what is he proposing? He hasn't proposed anything yet. He has, he's given us two quotes from the Great Controversy that he's using to try to set up his proposal. Okay. <clears throat> but but I, I read through it. It, it seems <laughs> like he's just saying that we need to study... A certain way is that the proposal? Well, let's let's look at his That's, five elements. Yeah, there are five main elements that make up this proposal: Miller's rules of interpretation, the King James version of the Bible, the old view of the daily is paganism, the study of Daniel in direct connection with Revelation, and Webster's eighteen twenty eight dictionary. Now, I will state this. If we're going, if we're going to be looking at this, we need to be looking at Miller's rules of biblical interpretation, not just interpretation. Mm -hmm. And we should 
be using the King James Version of the Bible that Father Miller had used as he was doing his studies. So it is a given that we will be using the spirit of prophecy to aid us in our understanding of key points in this study. Okay. So so he's laying down these five things. So his proposal, because the proposal is a plan or an idea, often formal or written one, which is suggested for people to think about and decide upon. So is his proposal that we use these rules? Is that what he, he's proposing? Well, I believe that he's proposing that we use the rules, but what I'm what I'm reading here is he's stating that there are five points to his proposition, but yet he adds a sixth, which he says is a given. Yeah. Okay. So you should have just put it as one of the. Yes. Because, I mean, in a sense, they all would be a given if, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I have, you know, at this point, I see six elements, not five. Yeah, I, I'm just still trying to understand what the proposition is. Right. Now, he wants to describe elements, but I'm not seeing the proposition. Mm -hmm. This is the issue that I'm having. Yeah, well, that was the problem that I was having. And so I, I, I just think it's kind of maybe implied or something that we have to decide whether we're going to accept these rules. I don't know. So then he's going to go through some spirit of prophecy statements about how to study based on Miller's rules. Right. Now, he he makes this comment. In this proposal, the first to consider is the use of Miller's rules of interpretation, or as I as I would present it, Miller's rules of biblical interpretation. Through the years, I have gleaned several quotes showing that there are rules to be observed in the way we study our Bibles. I'm only going to give the pertinent part of the quote, but will give the reference also for those who want to get the full context. So, I have been shown that there is a way to study the scriptures, as a quote from the 1888 materials, page 528, paragraph 4. We should know for ourselves what constitutes Christianity, what is truth, what is the faith we have received, and what are the Bible rules, the rules given us from the highest authority. Letter 4, 1889. Paragraph. Also, go ahead. Yeah, it's also in Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, right? Right. But what, I, I'm, what I'm looking at here that's, that's interesting, this is, you know, it is a, a straight-out sentence, but we're also looking at this from the source document and he's quoting this as being two paragraphs which i would find interesting so it'd be one that i would i would look at a little deeper we are living in perilous times in the fear of god i tell you that the true exposition of the scriptures is necessary for the correct moral development of our characters review and herald 14 of february 1889 paragraph 15 they the millerites believed that they had adopted sound principles of interpretation in their study of the scriptures, and that it was their duty to hold fast the truths already gained, and to still pursue the same course of biblical research. With earnest prayer, they reviewed their position and studied the scriptures to discover their mistake. As they could see no error in their explanation of the prophetic periods, they were led to examine more closely the subject of the sanctuary. Fourth Spirit of Prophecy, 259, paragraph 2. Now, is that, um, if I remember correctly, so this is after the great disappointment that this is a reference to? Is this a reference to, because this must be in after the great disappointment, that reference? Well, I would think that to be the case. Because of looking at the sanctuary. Okay. Because you know there is after the first disappointment an examination that goes on as well, but I yeah, but I think that's a different that would be worded a bit differently. Okay, that would be first. So with the first disappointment, so this is the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. 
So with the first disappointment, uh, their understanding had to do with when the periods ended. And then after the great disappointment, it had to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? So there's sort of two two steps of things that they have to study out. Um, and I don't know if we've ever really addressed that as far as how that relates to our movement specifically. Like, in, I mean, indirectly we've studied it, but not really in a direct way. Okay. If, if we look at the document itself, the paragraph prior to this would say to accept this conclusion was to renounce the former reckoning of the of the prophetic period so we step back even even one further this chapter in the spirit of prophecy is entitled the sanctuary it's chapter 18 yeah so it's going to be after the the, the disappointment correct yeah because it in for spirit of prophecy 258.2 the appointed time came and the Lord did not appear. The believers knew that God's word would not fail. Their interpretation of the prophecy must be at fault. But where was the mistake? Many rashly cut the knot of difficulty by denying the 2300 days ended in 1844. No reason could be given for this position except that Christ had not come at the time of expectation. Mm -hmm. They argued that if the prophetic days had ended in 1844, Christ would then have come to cleanse the sanctuary by the purification of the earth by fire, and that since he had not come, the days could not have ended. So, I mean, if we're looking at this, if we were studying just this part of the spirit of prophecy, mm -hmm. and we applied this to July 18th of 2020, we would have almost a parallel to this this entire time. Yeah, so I know this is a little bit off topic from his his, his study, but <clears throat> so we have uh, in the chapter, The Midnight Cry, mm -hmm. in the summer of 1844, Adventists discovered the mistake in their former reckonings of the prophetic periods and settled upon the correct position. Now, in some ways, that's sort of a simpler, a simplification of a very complicated uh, issue because this happened gradually over a long time. And, and in some ways, I'm not going to argue with the spirit of prophecy, but discovering their mistake in the former reckoning of the prophetic periods, in some ways they had discovered that already in 1843. Okay. Right. right. So they already recognized after the 1843 chart was made that there was no zero year in between BC and AD. But... The main problem had to do with that they that they that these are going to extend into the fall of right. 18, right? So that's so if you think about it, there is these these two sort of mistakes, and if you're applying Miller's rules, so when Ellen White says um, they believe they had adopted sound principles of interpretation, which is true except they hadn't necessarily applied them correctly, right? There, there were still things that they had to learn in, in their study, right? So as they were going through, you know, especially after they made the 1843 chart, well, they started to try to nail down, how do we, how do we know exactly when these prophetic periods end? Can we know, right? Correct. They're, so they're going to start refining that. Now, Miller's actually not really a part of that. No. Other than, you know, he's he suggests, well, I shouldn't say he's not a part of it. He's a part of a part of part of it, but not a part of all of it, in the sense that he's the first one who proposes that it's going to be the Jewish year, 1843, from the spring of 1843 to the spring of 1844. And he also proposes on May 2nd in 1843 that it will be the fall types uh, that will be connected with uh, the end of the prophetic periods, right? Or with the second coming, maybe. Because he's still going to have the prophetic periods end in the spring of 1844, right? So when he's proposing that the fall types are going to fulfill, you know, Christ's second coming, he, he, still, he still is not really understanding how the calendars work or anything like that, right? So it's... Um, it's going to be sort of after 
this um, eight, you know, the spring of, of 1843 that they're going to start really uh, looking at like the care right calendar and things like that. So it's going to, it's going to take time. So if we think about what happened in the movement, I mean, to me, there's really kind of a, a strong parallel with November 9th and the first disappointment and July 18, 2020, and the Great Disappointment, right? So November 9th, 2019, as taking that role, which we've found in our study of judges. But you can see it quite clearly here in, in the development of, of sort of a correcting. There's this correcting going on or this understanding of things, this further light that says, well, we were wrong in some ways about certain things. God was leading us but we didn't see some things yet. And, um, you know, so in the context of people now within the movement following Jeff, you know, rejecting October 22nd, I mean, July 18, 2020, right? They're rejecting basically the light of the midnight cry. They're rejecting Adventist history. Yeah, that would be agreed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, especially with, with what we have seen that is unfortunately going on since these last presentations that Elder Jeff had done. Mm -hmm. Which I haven't watched. I just know by hearsay. So, Well, I've listened. I have not watched because there's very little really to watch. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay. Next, he quotes from Review and Herald, 25th of November, 1884. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. In the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology, Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. One, every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. Two, all scripture is necessary and may be understood by diligent application and study three nothing revealed in scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith not wavering four to understand doctrine bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know then let every word have its proper influence and if you can form your theory without a contradiction you cannot be in error five scripture must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself if I depend on a teacher to expound to me and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or to be thought wise, then his guessing, desire, creed, or wisdom is my rule and not the Bible. The above is a portion of these rules. And in our study of the Bible, we shall all do well to heed the principles set forth. This is a quote that's been used multiple times. Mm -hmm. Now, the number five, I mean, it actually ties in a bunch of other things that he later on lists in his rules, such as the one you must have faith, where he goes on about sectarian creeds and so forth. Right. So when we when we look at these um, these points that he brings up, depending upon a teacher, well, Parminder definitely wanted us to depend upon him. Right. Uh, also, you know, people guessing at the meaning. Something I never like doing is guessing. I don't like speculative ideas. Right. To me, things need to be really solid. And sometimes people just grab onto an idea because it sounds good. That's sort of what I think about with these speculative, you know, ideas or guessing at meanings. And then, of course, that goes along with, you know, desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed, which is, you know, we, we like things that agree with what we already know. That's pretty human. There's nothing wrong with that. We look for information, but, you know, that agrees with us. But we also need to be challenged. And then, of course, we can see that, that for some people, what other people think about them, so presenting something to sort of show off or get followers or just, you know, which, which, which I run into quite a bit. And, and one of the ways I know that is the way that they communicate to me, like on YouTube videos or social media is 
they often accuse me of really what they're doing, right? So they they have some idea or theory that they want me to accept because they've presented something that they think is amazing. And the fact that I don't just accept it and that I challenge it in some way to them is quite offensive. I don't know if you've seen some of the comments in YouTube videos, um, you know, these prophets and so forth that uh, uh, believe that they have some insight and they think that I'm acting like them, right? That, that I have, you know, they sort of see themselves in competition with me in some way. But the reality is, you know, we're not looking for followers. We're just studying, right? We're just sharing online what we know. And so, you know, the whole purpose of Miller's Rules is for each individual to decide for themselves. So we need to employ these rules ourselves, not depend on somebody else to employ them for us, because that would be against Miller's Rules. Okay. Now, he is going to give us a list of or link to Miller's Rules later. Right. All of us have studied Miller's Rules, I hope. Well, I would say that a lot of us have a working understanding of Miller's Rules. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you when you start going through Miller's Rules as to the various Bible verses that are given as support within each of the rules, mm -hmm. which in and of itself can be a very interesting study. Yeah, which is... You know, which is what I've done. I've gone through the, the Bible verses in Miller's Rules. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if we should do a, an in-depth study on those, go th through that together, or if we should just have people do it individually. But but part of the, the insight is when you start looking at the verses, he, he's actually employing the rules to, to derive the rules, if that makes sense. Right? It. The rules come from the scriptures themselves. So he's not just telling you, here are the rules. He's showing from the Bible that this is how we are to study the Bible. The Bible tells us itself how to study it. Okay. You know, if you look at like number seven, which says, you know, visions are always mentioned as such. We get second Corinthians 12 verse one and it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, in that one, I, I don't know if that verse that verse actually tells us that, right? So that that's one of the ones I was always like, well, he doesn't got a bunch of Bible verses explaining that. I don't know if you looked into that before. I have not. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm just looking here. Yeah, so he just has one proof, you know, 2 Corinthians. So I'm not sure how he draws that. And and the question is, are visions always mentioned as such? Well, I, I would think that's kind of pretty clear that you can see it's a vision, right? But I don't know how that verse shows that. So Rule 7 always puzzled me a bit. But other ones are, you know, lots of Bible verses, and you can easily show that. Okay. Drawing from his own experience with the use of these rules, William Miller would say, the Bible was now to me a new book. It was indeed a feast of reason, all that was dark, mystical or obscure to me in its teachings, had been dissipated from my mind before the clear light that now dawned from its sacred pages. And oh, how bright and glorious the truth appeared. All the contradictions and inconsistencies mm -hmm. I had before found in the word were gone. And although there were many portions of which I was not satisfied, I had a full understanding. Yet so much light had emanated from it to the illumination of my before darkened mind that I felt a delight in studying the scriptures, which I had not before supposed could be derived from its teachings. Memories of William Miller by Sylvester Bliss, 1853, page 76, paragraph 2. Here he makes the offer that for those who may be unfamiliar with Miller's rules or for anyone who would like to view them in their entirety, they can be downloaded from our website or just go back to our main page and click on Miller's rules. 
the King James Version of the Bible. There are three points to be made as to why this is a part of the proposal. Premise number one, Miller's rules cannot be used on any other version. Premise two, the translators have already done their work. Premise three, most of all modern versions have come after the fall of Protestantism. Now, as a question, King James Version of the Bible, as published by Andrews University, is this a version of the King James Bible that can be trust, trusted? By Andrews? I didn't know they published a King James Version of the Bible. I believe you'll find that they've done a couple of them. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, I've studied a lot about Bible translations. So I understand, you know, all Bible translations have their limitations, even the King James. Now, the King James is more of a word-for-word -word translation than uh, things like the NIV, which I don't consider a, tra a version of the Bible. It is a paraphrase, paraphrase. So version, like the Latin Vulgate is a version. The Septuagint is a version. The King James is a version. But the NIV is not, Right. It shouldn't it shouldn't be called the new international version, but because it's not it's not a, a basically a word for word translation. Now, now, of course, a literal translation like Young's still has limitations, because when you take a Hebrew word and you translate it into English, there isn't one English word that matches every Hebrew word in all of its connotations and and implications. Right. Right. And and sometimes that English word can have meanings that the Hebrew word does not contain. Right. OK. So so I don't see how anybody could argue for any translation as the sole translation of the scriptures. I mean, I understand, you know, the new translations have their problems and I don't really use them. I use a bunch of old translations, and I use, of course, the Hebrew and Greek with uh, the E sword. And, and it doesn't take a lot of, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to sort of use some of those tools. Now, when you're going to look at a form of a word and you're looking at the syntactical relationship of that word to the other words in the verse, I mean, that's a bit more specialized. And that's why looking at Sometimes a few of the other older translations can give you a sense of something different. But I, I don't know if I agree with this idea that we, uh, because I know some people that they will use the King James solely. And even when the King James has a mistranslation, example would be Ezekiel chapter 40, verse one, where it says, you know, at the start of the year, right in the. 10th day of the month at the beginning of the year, right? And they say, well, the beginning of the year is in the spring, right? Because that's when the year begins, right? So, but we know that it's Rosh Hashanah, which you can only know by looking at the, at the Hebrew. You can't tell that by looking at, but you could, you could figure it out based upon the chronology of the text, but it would be quite difficult. Right. So in the 25th year of the captivity at the beginning of the year, in the 10th month, in the 14th year after the city was smitten. Right. So you'd have to know a lot about the chronology to sort of realize that it must be in the fall of the year. But, you know, there's there's lots of other verses, obviously, where looking at the Hebrew is going to be helpful, such as Daniel 8 dealing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination of desolation. How long should you write? So that taking away of the daily is different than the taking away of the daily in Daniel 11, 31 and 12, 11, right? Now you make a point always that we need the Apocrypha because that's what, what uh, William Miller had in his Bible. Correct. Now, part of the reason arguing for the Apocrypha is one is it gives us information that we need to know that generally is unknown, and, and that is the intertestamental period. So Christians in the past would have had an understanding of the intertestamental period. If you're going to understand Daniel 11, for instance, 
um, that we can use Maccabees uh, to understand that history, but we would have we would have um, no understanding of Daniel 11 without that history. Is that Correct. part of what's happening? That's and we also at Esther. So there are some things that that we have taken the position that that Esther originally had additional material that was taken out of the Hebrew scriptures that is contained in the Apocrypha, Esther, right? Correct. So that, that's a bit controversial. Some people would say, well, no, that stuff was added, um, not taken out. But uh, we saw that it was actually consistent and that there may have been a reason that it was taken out uh, to take out all references to God, because Esther is the only one that has no reference to God. So we don't we don't know though. That would, in some ways, that's speculation. But we saw that there was a consistency in the apocryphal Esther. There was no reason to to assume that 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 translation was from uh, the Hebrew with a bunch of added material. So because it it claims to be a translation from the Hebrew original. And so Ellen White is quite clear that the Apocrypha is not, it's not the pure word of God, but that there are things in there that we need to understand. Right. So we're never using the Apocrypha as a doctrinal um, source, because there are things in the Apocrypha that definitely uh, don't represent uh, the teachings of Scripture. And and we would we would say things like, you know, uh, some of the stories in there, which I'm not going to go into, that definitely they, they don't really belong in the Bible. But those are easy to tell by reading them. Now, there's also the pseudepigrapha, which some people also try to um, add that aren't part of the Apocrypha, you know, such as the Book of Enoch. Right. Right. And uh, Jubilees. Right. So we got these. They're definitely not biblical books. They were books that uh, the Jews uh, had. Uh, but when you read through them, you can see clearly that, you know, these are pretty fanciful and uh, not scripture. But there, there's an interest in reading them. It's not like, you know, I don't think people should avoid reading them at all. But when you try to treat them like the word of God as if they're inspired books, you know, definitely Enoch was not written by Enoch. You can tell when it was written in, in the Greek period. But okay, anything else on that, Dwight? Not that I can think of. Okay. First and foremost, Miller's rules cannot be applied to any other version than the KJV. This does not expose a weak point with these rules, but instead reveals the lack of continuity attending the use of the many different versions of the Bible. So he's arguing that you can't use Miller's rules if you're not using the King James. Correct. Why? He just believes at this, from what he's presenting here, that Miller's rules will only work with the KJV, that it will not work with any other. But how, how could that be? So he's just saying if you if you try to use Miller's rules and you're using the Bishop's Bible or Tyndale's Bible. What about Douay Reims? Will you run into, into different conclusions? Is that what he's saying? So if I, 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 cause so the Douay Bible, well, there's Douay Reims and Douay, right? So which are you referring to? I, like, I stated Douay Reims and that's. So which one is that? Um, cause I only know of the do. I mean, I've heard of, are they the same thing is what I'm asking? I believe they are the same thing. Okay. Why is one, why do they sometimes just refer to it as, let me look this up because this confuses me. So the Douay Reims, so that's a translation from the Latin Vulgate. So that's just the Douay Bible, I guess, hey? Okay. So they just, so sometimes people just refer to it as the Douay Bible. No, right? to, be, to be clear, the King James primarily used what's called the Textus Receptus for its base trend portion of the translation. Right, and because it's going to be translated from the original languages, which 
the Catholic Bible is translated from Latin Vulgate. Correct. Okay. So I mean, I'm not sure what all the differences are. Okay, so when he continued with this other paragraph, in translating the Bible from the original languages to English, the translators have accomplished what we cannot. In other words, they did for us what we needed by rendering something that we could not understand into something that we could. But the fact remains that it's still God's word, and as such, no matter how plain it may be in English, we still need to employ the correct method of study in order to truly understand, especially as it pertains to prophecy. All of the versions of the Bible since the original King James Version are only an attempt to provide that understanding. Their focus is on the original languages, which can never give us the deep, deeper spiritual understanding that we need. In other words, they are simply rehashing over and over again what the translators of the King James have already accomplished. Only the Holy Spirit, through his appointed version and method, can give us the true understanding of his word. Now, one of the points that I came to understand a long time ago, since the King James was published in 1611, there were multiple King James versions of the Bible that were published until we came down to the authorized revised version of the King James that was published in 1769. To state that only the King James can be used can be problematic because there was a version that sticks in my mind of the King James that is called the adultery version because that version of the King James was published stating thou shall commit adultery. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a typo, but, uh, but it's still a version of the King James. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I, I, I don't agree with his, his, his reasoning here. Agreed. I'm um, now, as far as the due, I just read up a bit on it. So, I mean, the Latin Vulgate, obviously has some problems with it itself. Right. So then you translation of that into English. Um, but I'm not sure particularly could somebody come to an understanding of the 2300 days. I, I'd have to look at the, the translation itself and see, you know, because even when it comes to the Greek New Testament, I mean, there's all different kinds of um, spellings and, and um you know, there's lots of different manuscripts and, and people can point out about all the different errors or differences, I guess you would say. But none of the differences affect the doctrines of the scriptures. If, right. If I'm not mistaken, the Douay version does not refer to the 2300 days. It tries to make it 2400. 2400? Okay. Yes. Not sure how they would have done that, but... Um... Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's, so uh, to me, you compare all of the scriptures. So you have, I mean, not everybody can do that, right? Not everybody can look at every translation and every, every manuscript, but we have tools that can help us look at the original languages. And I don't think that that should be discounted. I just think, you know, the King James is the best Bible for Bible study. It's going to, it's, it's, it's like um, the foundation on which you can study scripture. With other translations, you have to be a lot more cautious because there's a lot more interpretive elements. But we, we saw in Daniel chapter 11 that the King James translators, they understand the Tychus Epiphanes as uh, being, you know, the one that exalts himself to establish the vision. The breakers of thy people is going to be Greece. You know, it has nothing to do with Rome, right? So the translators of the King James have their biases as well. So he's sort of saying that this is the Holy Spirit appointed this version, the Holy Spirit through his appointed version, right? Do we take that position that the King James version is appointed by the Holy Spirit to be the version? you know, in that sort of extreme sense. I mean, I know people who believe that. Would it be a foundational yeah. version? Would King James be a foundational version? 
Well, it's a foundation upon which you should build. It's it's a solid foundation as far as the translation is concerned. But you still have to study it, and studying it includes looking at the Hebrew and Greek, looking at other versions as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I've always approached it that way. But, you know, I don't use the New King James Version as my primary version or the Revised Standard Version or the New Revised Standard Version or the American That's Standard what Version. what I'm saying, yeah. That was, that was what I was saying. Yeah. And definitely when I started looking at the NIV, uh, when I was 16, my brother David gave me an NIV. You know, and I quickly abandoned that uh, uh, Bible just because, one is I found it really hard to read. The King James... Once I started studying that as an Adventist, I found it's actually the easiest translation to understand, you know, of, of like definitely the easiest version to understand. The new revi- the, the, the revised standard version uses a lot more um, technical words, bigger words, uh, less plain English. But I don't know. What did other people think about this? KJV was the first, first, first Bible that I read. And it's the one that I, I continue to read, but I sometimes have some contentions with people who ins- insist that it's it's infallible, like it, it, there's no flaws in the translation, and don't welcome it when I point out that there are, are some flaws here and there, but few. And that's why I also use the, the e-sword, because I don't know the languages of Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, to me, Esort is this gift that God has given us. Because I remember when I first, you know, started studying as an Adventist. I mean, I had my Thayer's uh, Greek lexicon and my um, Jesenius lexicon, and I had um, uh, Brown Drivers Briggs uh, lexicon, and I had my uh, Young's concordance and my Strong's concordance. And it took forever to to get, you know, when you're looking at a verse to try to figure out exactly, especially a verse that you, you read and it doesn't make sense, right? Because there are verses like that in the King James that they just, they don't make sense until you really start digging into them. Or even some of the things that seem like apparent contradictions. When you start looking at, at the original, you get uh, a different impression. So... Um, but if people are going to take the position of King James onlyists in the sense that it's kind of like an inspired Bible that God appointed it, you know, what do you do if you're German? Or what do you do if you're from Vietnam? You know, can somebody who is a German and doesn't know English, can they use Miller's rules? You know, if they're going to use Luther's Bible or some other translation from uh, the Textus Receptus. It's, you know, for me, it's it, it's interesting because if we were using a Bible in the German, in Spanish, and in other languages, there are a lot of things from those languages that are a lot more clear than some of what we have found was translated in the King James. Yeah. Yeah, now a lot of people make you know a problem well that language is archaic, and he's going to of course argue for Webster's 1828 uh, dictionary as a way of dealing with that problem. Right. But still, when you look at an English word, that English word has meanings that maybe that Hebrew word doesn't contain. Exactly. And and now, now I've seen people do this. You know, basically they're looking at a, at at just the wrong meaning of that English word, and they extrapolate a whole bunch of ideas from that. And sometimes it becomes a foundational view from which they depart from Adventism because they're they're not going to because they you know they accept the King James in some way, and then they they take the meaning of a word and they I'm not going to use an example, but uh, because I can't think of any real I mean I can think of a few, but to be long to explain, so none that are going to be simple. But, um, you know, people will catch on one idea, and, you know, yet if they looked at the Hebrew, they would never have drawn that conclusion from the text. It's just they're they're drawing that conclusion from an English word, which 
Um, well, here's a good example. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. They're going to use uh, that word uh, parousia, right? Coming. All right. Okay. And now this is sort of in, in a sense uh, where they're going to say that the coming of Christ is invisible. So they're not using the Greek per, per se, they, but the Greek behind it is parousia. And, and they're going to say that that, that coming, because Christ came invisibly to the earth in 1915, right? 1914. 14, yeah, 14. I think originally they had 1915 and they changed it to 1914. Um, but anyway, uh, so 1914, that's what the year they have now. But actually, if you look at the Greek word, it's it can never be used in the sense of an invisible or secret coming. Because it's it's like the coming of a king into his throne room. Right? You're familiar with right. that? Right. Right. So looking at the Greek is helpful in that case, but they have this whole thing uh, that the coming is is secret, invisible, which, of course, the word, the verse that they use could never mean that. So, you know, so there's so there's definitely value in looking at the Hebrew and Greek. Now, now, Miller argues that you don't need to use the Hebrew and Greek. And um, who was it who uh, was it? Um, uh, Wycliffe or Tyndale, one of those who talked about how somebody studying the scriptures could know more, uh, like uh, like basically a plowboy could understand uh, the scriptures. That's a quote uh, of Wycliffe. Wycliffe, okay, right. And the context there is that, you know, by putting it into English, you know, we can understand the scriptures. But, you know, that's not the King James, Right. And and I think Strong's quotes that in his concordance, if I'm not mistaken, in his introduction to his not con yeah, Strong's concordance, um, that he's providing information that will help us to study the scriptures so that we can we can see into them uh, more deeply. Because, you know, a person could have argued that, you know, we all just need to know Hebrew and Greek in order to understand the scriptures. So by putting it into English, somebody is helping us, but they're not. I think we we can't depend upon that solely, right? It, it you understand what I'm saying? You know, that's like somebody deciding for us what the scriptures say when they make a translation of it. And God can preserve His word, but Ellen White's quite clear that you know it doesn't mean that that we just that we can't we don't study it. Right. We have to study it and understand it. And the Holy Spirit can lead us. And since the Holy Spirit can lead us as individuals. Right. Because no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost can teach us. And and I, I think even if a person has a poor translation, they can arrive to a great understanding of the scriptures based upon their connection with Christ. Okay, I must correct my statement. Okay. Your, the quote that you're referring to was, I defy the Pope and his laws. If God spares my life in a few years, a plowboy shall know more of the scriptures than you do. Right? Okay. Yeah. And that was Tyndale arguing with a bishop. Okay. okay. So it was not Wycliffe. Okay, so it's Tyndale, and Tyndale's the first one who put uh, the Bible into English, right? That's the one that King James is the basis of. Correct. Okay. Now, the other the other portion, um, the manuscript that's denoted as being LXX, the Septuagint. Okay. Yeah. Now, it is claimed that the LXX which Septuagint, however, I mean, I see that as the number 70. Yeah, that's what Septuagint means. Okay. Has 2,400 instead of a 2,300 figure in Daniel 8.14. Ah. There is a misprint in only one version of the Septuagint, which is Vaticanus. 
Okay, so the Vatican's manuscript. Yes. Correct. Okay, so that that that's what I kind of thought. Um, I wasn't sure if it was in like the Latin Vulgate or something, but I didn't think it was uh, in a translation. But yeah, so it was the the Vaticanus manuscript. Okay. Okay. No. Which Jehovah's Witnesses used to depend upon in their uh, uh, polyglot Bible uh, that they used to use. Yeah, it's it's yeah. interesting that there are those also that claim that Joseph Wolf, Jerome, and Thomas Newton confirm manuscripts that had a figure of 2,200 versus the 2,300 or the 2,400. How? Oh. So, but, I mean, here again, the Textus Receptus has it as 2,300 evening morning. In yeah. Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Well, technically, when we when we talk about the Old Testament, the Textus Receptus refers to the New Testament. Okay. So, right, technically, so. But yeah, so the, the the King James is based up on the Hebrew, and there's really only two Hebrew Bibles. Well, we often talk about the Masoretic text, so that would be uh, the text, and there's only two different versions of them, and they, they differ in only a few places. So, okay. So, in this, the statement is made. Finally, it has been noted that most all of the modern versions of the Bible are a product of various Protestant denominations and organizations and have appeared after the door was closed to them in 1844. So, yes, I have stated multiple times that I have preferred for my personal study to make use of the 1769 authorized revised version of the King James. I have had personal conversation with Glenn, who has stated to me that the King James is the King James, and the version doesn't matter. So... His his logic here, when when I have pointed out the fact that Father Miller, Ellen White, James White, the pioneers of the faith, had been making use of the 1769 King James, he wants to set that aside. So, so he doesn't have any interest in in, in looking at the apocrypha at all. Correct. I had I, I had gifted him one of the Bibles that I use, and when he moved to Alaska, it was his decision that it was just not necessary. He had a King James that he had with Ellen White quotes in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sounds like the Remnant Study Bible could very well be yeah. something like that. <laughs> I mean, I just use Esau pretty much um, right. because of the, the convenience of being able to look at the Hebrew and Greek. And and to do, uh, so one of the things, obviously, comparing scripture with scripture. So you can compare the English words, but sometimes you'll miss out on a verse um, that in the Hebrew is connected, but doesn't appear connected in English. Right. Right. So being able to use uh, the King James Concordance, for instance. Uh, Strong's King James Concordance, so I can compare the strong numbers. Um, and also just having the dictionaries and looking at, at the meanings of the words and where they come from and their different connections. You can do that without knowing Hebrew and Greek. You can just, you can see, okay, this word means this and it comes from this other word. And, and then you can get an idea of, oh, this 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 has a, a different meaning. Example is when we look at um, you know, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there little. And you look at the word precept and you see it comes from a word that means to set things in order. Right. Then you understand what a precept is. Well, it's a teaching. Um, but it's it's something that's that's taught in in order. Right. It's organized. And so if you say precept upon precept, you know, to set things in order. And then align a cob, but you wouldn't get that 
necessarily, I mean, you, you could draw it from looking at the word line, but when you start to look at the word line and you see that it's referring to like a measuring line, uh, then you can start to see, well, we're going to put things in order upon a line, line upon line. And you can look at, you know, the line of Samaria and the line of Jerusalem, you know, and then you can start to put, well, these are prophetic periods. These are lines of, of prophecy. So you would have a hard time getting that just from the King James without those comparisons. Okay, Dwight? Okay. This point needs careful consideration. Just as the Jews were left in darkness after their rejection of John and Christ, so were the Protestants left in the darkness after their rejection of the first and second angels' messages. See Early Writings, pages 259 to 261. This would certainly apply to their publishing houses as well. Even the supposed Adventist translations rely upon Protestant criterion. So, my question returns. Does this, does this statement then support a contention that I am raising that the Remnant Study Bible, the Ellen White Study Bible, the versions that are published from Andrews University are very much in line with his statement here about this would certainly apply to their publishing houses as well. So you're saying that if whoever publishes it, even if it's the King James, that that's a problem? Um, well, not quite. I'm, I'm just asking, I'm asking that question. I mean... Because he's saying that that Adventists in publishing the King James, is he talking about the King James or other translations of the Bible? He's making a blanket statement that is include that would seem to be including the King James. Now, yeah, that's that's what I gathered. Yeah. The the issue that I've got has quite a bit to do with a specific King James version that was published by those at Andrews University. And if I re if I'm recalling this correctly, this version is in the footnotes in Daniel, it is giving rise to accepting the new view of the daily versus the old view. Oh, okay. So it's not in the, the, the verses itself, just in footnotes. Correct. Yeah, which is one of the things. Um, now, when the King James was published, the 1611 King James, you know, prior to that, a lot of the translations, um, they actually had a lot of footnotes, a lot of commentary in right. in the Bibles. And the, and the King James was really published without commentary, just uh, column references, if I remember correctly, and sort of limited column references. Now, so the thing is, there's lots of different, um, you know, people have published the Bible with different, uh, you know, references, right? So not every, so you got Oxford, they have their sort of group of references in Cambridge. They seem to be pretty similar. But one of the things about publishing Bibles is all these different footnotes or things that are added uh, to sort of aid in study. Now, of course, in the past, they were really helpful when I first started studying because, you know, I could look in the column and it'll say, well, here's another verse that talks about this. So, you know, we used to have chain reference Bibles as well, and you could put stickers in your Bible to connect the different scriptures together. But now with eSword, I mean, a lot of these tools are sort of rendered uh, obsolete, right? Okay. So I don't know. It, it's, he doesn't say anything about eSword, but... Uh, no, he doesn't. Does he use eSword, do you know? I don't know. I couldn't state. Oh, yeah. I think it's one of the great, great gifts of the internet is eSword. And I've looked, I've even purchased other uh, Bible software in the past before eSword. It was pretty useless. And, and, of course, they wanted you to buy lots of other additional material. In the second article of this series, we have gone into detail concerning the question of the daily. In assessing the old and the new views of the daily, it becomes immediately apparent 
that there can be no harmony between the two. When we remove all of the fluff that surrounds both views, we are left with two opposing and antagonistic principles. The one, the old view, states that the daily is of Satan. The other, the new view, states that the daily is of God. Almost without exception, Adventism has embraced the new view. It cannot be overstated that the prophetic understanding of Daniel 11, 31 to 45 turns on this one thing. Whichever view is applied will then determine the direction that is traveled. This T in the road is found at the very beginning of the final portion of Daniel's prophecy. In other words, it is at verse 31 that the prophetic understanding of the rest of the chapter is determined. The new view is the result of Protestant methods of interpretation, while the old view comes to us from the application of Miller's rules. The book of Daniel cannot be studied alone. Okay, so so um, just getting so in the second article, he actually states more clearly than anything he says in the st- second article, right? Okay. Right. So we uh, when I went through the second article, so what he's saying is is that there's two opposing views that that are antagonistic. So either the daily is paganism, right, that is of Satan. Or it is Christ's heavenly ministry, right? That's the new view. Now, I think that there is, to say that there can be no harmony between the two, that is, we know that what they were trying to do, if you look at the pioneer understanding of the daily, there was no place for Christ's heavenly sanctuary ministry, right? Okay. Right. So so Christ's heavenly sanction the cr- fact that Christ has a heavenly sanctuary ministry wasn't really a part of a Mount understanding or the daily. That is, they didn't fully comprehend that the first 1260 is a counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary, that is, paganism is a counterfeit of the earthly, and papalism account is a counterfeit of the heavenly. Right? So if we had understood the 2520 and its relation to the week of Christ there would have been no room for the new view of the daily to come in. Does that make sense? Yes. Right. So that's sort of what we saw when we, when we studied Uriah Smith's material on Daniel chapter 12 specifically, but also chapter 11. Now, then when he's saying that the key to understanding Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 to 45 is that you have to understand the pioneer view of the daily because that's that's where he's making this argument. So he has never made it very clearly exactly how, but we can see that obviously the taking away of the daily and the setting up the abomination of desolation is mentioned there in verse 31. That's the focus of verse 31 of Daniel 11, just as it is of, of 12 verse 11, taking away of the daily, the setting up of the abomination of desolation. So these two desolating powers, but he doesn't really explain anything beyond that. So he says there's this T, but he doesn't logically follow through how that the, I mean, obviously the new view of the daily is going to affect some things, but I don't know directly how it affects Daniel 11, 40 to 45, right? In his understanding, he he never explains this. So you got thoughts on that, Dwight? Or anyone. In order to have more properly established his premise on the daily, he needed to be a lot more direct. He touched on points, but he never developed the points. Mm -hmm. So this. Because I don't quite see this T in the road the way that he sees it. No, there isn't. But there is. But there is things that we do need to understand, which we brought out when we studied Uriah Smith's paper. Right. But he's not seeing that. He doesn't appear to see exactly why. So it just seems to me like he has unformed ideas. Well, in the past, in the history of the church, we have had multiple people that have been presumed to being great historians. First, we wind up with Uriah Smith. 
Then we have Professor Prescott. Then we have Leroy Frum. Mm -hmm. Then George Knight. And then George Knight. Now, all of these have had difficulty with specific portions of pioneer understanding. Mm -hmm. And particularly had, the prophetic periods. I mean, exactly. Smith had his problem with the 2520. Prescott had his problems with the 2300. Mm -hmm. Froome had his problem with the Trinity and with other items. And then Knight has been an amalgamation of all. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are looking to these for some of our understanding, or when we're looking to any of these for some of our understanding, our direct basis for what we are choosing to hold on to can become colored and can become different from that of what the what the true pioneers had with had held. Oh, okay. So we're we're Seventh Day Adventists. We've all, you know, we all have pretty much become Adventists. Some of us might have been raised Adventists, but at some point we came to uh, believe in Adventism, right? Right, correct. And we, our understanding of Adventism was definitely incomplete when we first made a decision to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Right. And, and then we continued studying, and we would start to find that, you know, there's different voices out there with all different kinds of views and ideas, and we have to sort through them. And uh, we've seen people go off into different directions, some leaving the Adventist church, right? Some just becoming sort of Laodicean Adventists, you know, we're all Laodicean Adventists, but you know what I mean, right? Right. They, they, they don't recognize anything that there's any problem with them at all. They're not really concerned. Uh, so, you know, we could call them maybe nominal Adventists. And then we've seen people go in fanatical directions within the Adventist church. You know, some still sort of staying on the fringes of Adventism to varying degrees, right? And and everybody calling out, you know, for attention to be drawn to them in some way. They have some truth or some understanding that everybody else has to listen to. And we saw this with this movement. I mean, I've always been sort of opposed to following uh, movements within Adventism, right? So... The closest I would have had that is uh, my connection with light bearers. I was really, you know, like Ty Gibson as a person. And I like the way that he first presented when he first started. He used to just read lots of spirit of prophecy, right, without much commentary on his own. He'd just bring together spirit of prophecy quotes and, and they had a publishing ministry and, then, you know, I supported them. But, you know, I became quite disillusioned with Ty once he started becoming more popular he definitely changed his direction. He still tried to maintain that he was conservative, but obviously he had departed from some very basic principles of scripture. And then we saw, um, you know, with, with Jeff Pippinger, I mean, you know, I've never been officially a part of uh, Future for America or anything. But, you know, I was a little leery uh, going to a camp meeting. And yet, you know, what Jeff has brought to bring us back to Millerite history is absolutely, absolutely what had to happen. Right. I mean, okay. without, without this understanding, I don't think that we could have, I, I personally could never have moved forward as an Adventist without first looking back on Millerite history and understanding. I was sort of in a, you know, a stalemate to some degree uh, spiritually, you know, I had, fallen away to some degree as an Adventist. I was still going to church, but, you know, I had some real personal difficulties. And at the time, I was praying to understand uh, Adventism. I was going back to the basics. And and uh, Pippinger came along at just the right time for me personally. I don't know what about other people and how they saw it uh, for them, you know, how this light has helped them. So... We have um, this friend of yours, Glenn. So he's the one who brought you to Adventism, or not to Adventism, to the 2520, right? 
to Jeff to Pittman? Jeff. Yes. Yeah. So he was following Jeff fully, or was he? No, initially, initially, because he was an elder at the Newport Church, he had attended meetings that had gone on in the church that Dario Taylor had presented. And this was after Jeff had been up in the area. So Jeff went up there first, Dario Taylor presented later? Correct. Okay. And I was thought Stereo presented first, but okay. Um, no, but Jeff, I... Jeff presented at a church just south of Newport. Okay. And then Dario came up to do a series okay. at the Newport church. Okay. Yeah. And the comment that was made at that time was that when he gave this, this presentation, you could see in the church itself a great divide occurring. Mm. Now, it was after that point that Bill and Mary Campbell began doing a prayer meeting, but so that it didn't conflict with the prayer meeting that Newport was, was doing on a regular basis, they would do their prayer meeting on a Tuesday and the regular prayer meeting would be done on a Wednesday. So for a, a period of time, the prayer meeting on Tuesday that was being done at the Newport Church was done with the charts until such time as the church basically said, we want nothing further to do with these charts. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, So they, they were kind of studying the charts, trying to understand the right history. Correct. Which... That the church actually, you know, has has stood up against that I find really strange. But uh. so I was asked to attend some of these meetings to see what what I could make of them. And there there were other meetings that I had attended that have to which I have been a witness. Now that's where I came into this. That's the the portion that began this for me. Now, for me, it was a bit of a review because the charts, as they were used, was something that I had seen about 1973 in the Bible classes that we had at the local junior academy. Mm -hmm. And that was my first year in that academy. It was my choice to attend that academy. But I remember these charts and I remember them very well. Mm -hmm. So it's it, it was interesting for me to see them again presented in front of the church. But it was intriguing to try to understand exactly why the church would be battling against its very foundation mm -hmm. yeah and that was the thing for me because i understood um you know i'd studied 1888 right so i understood that part of our history but there was always this sort of impression of millerite history that millers millerites taught lots of false doctrine and it was just full of errors and and, you know, I never I never had read anything Miller had written before, never really looked at Millerite history other than what you see in the Great Controversy. Right. Or Spirit of Prophecy. So uh, uh, the point that I'm making here is that we've all had to sort through this. So we have we have to examine the foundation. And in order to do that, we do need to go back to Miller's rules. Right. Correct. Right. I mean, there's no way that we could, you know, understand Millerite history without and understand our doctrines without going back and, and studying in, in that way. And I think that's part of the maybe the disservice that that I've had as an Adventist is that Adventism really doesn't know how to study. Right. I mean, it used to, but but it it's. Um, the way that Adventists study now is more devotional. We right? come to the point point where it's more sermonizing in Adventism. 
Yeah, sermonizing and and devotional studies. Like you, uh, you read, you know, a story in the Old Testament. You try to learn, you know, what is the moral of the story, sort of thing. It's like we're reading Aesop's fables. I don't know if people agree with me on that, but that's kind of the impression I get in Adventism. So, I mean, and probably that division that happened in Newport was partly because a lot of people don't want to go that direction, right? Not everybody's really interested in in studying the Bible. Well, there's a there's a point that I can make, but we are at the close of our time today. Yeah, we went a bit over. Okay, well, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow. Uh, we, we will return to this in the morning. So do we have any other comments or questions regarding what we've covered so far today? Okay, then shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much yet that we need to understand. Please help us, Father. Please direct us. Please guide us in all that you would have us to know and to understand. I ask your blessing upon those that have attended today, those that have contributed, and those that will view this later. Help us now, Father, as we continue through this day, that we may more properly represent your name and your character in all the things that we are to do. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. In this and in all ways, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.